So welcome back everybody to another webinar series organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Lord Mervyn King with us. Hi Mervyn. Hello Marcus. Good to see you, it's a pleasure to have you. We will talk today about central banking, inflation, and many other hot topics going back a little bit in history, uh, how central banking has managed past challenges and uh, what, you know, looking forward into the future a little bit as well. So I would like to start our conversation uh, right away from the start uh, by asking, you know, we have the challenges now that inflation is going up a lot. And, you know, the central banks are trying to orchestra some soft landing. How do you best orchestra a soft landing? And is there some historical evidence, you know, that we can actually achieve this easily or how to best achieve it, or it's already too late? And you also introduced at some point in some speech and also in your book, the Maradona approach to monetary policy. Perhaps you can explain us whether that will help us or what is the Maradona approach to monetary policy? Well, I'm very pleased to be on your, your webinar series, Marcus, but the first question is about as difficult one as you could answer. I don't pretend to know whether it's going to be possible to engineer a soft landing. I think it's going to be very difficult because of one obvious point which is if the Federal Reserve were to ask us today, you know, what should we do? The only sensible answer would be to say, I wouldn't start from here. They have got themselves into a position in which almost irrespective of how you think about forecasting inflation, whether you think about a Taylor rule or any variant of a Taylor rule, or looking at the monetary aggregates or thinking about the budget deficit, the fiscal theory of determination of, of inflation. All of those have the same one thing in common, which is that interest rates today are well below where they would be if you wanted to keep inflation low and stable. So I think that the challenge for the Fed and the, uh, what is going to make a soft landing extraordinarily difficult is that you know, you look at the excited commentary in the press about maybe three or even four interest rate rises in 2022. Well, let's suppose there were four quarter point increases. Interest rates would still, this time next year, be well below anything that a Taylor rule or almost any view about how to bring inflation down would suggest that you need to get to. And if the Fed moves a lot faster, then what will happen is that almost inevitably, with higher interest rates, asset prices relative to incomes will be lower than before. And some of that will be brought about through higher income levels through higher inflation. But some of it, no doubt, will also come through falls in asset prices. And that will lead people to say, oh, asset prices are down, that will dampen the economy. We better stop that. The Fed mustn't go too quickly. But to get to the right level of interest rates, you just have to accept that the consequence of that is a lower level of asset prices relative to incomes. So I think that um, you know, maybe events in the world will conspire to make it easier to meet a soft landing. But unless something makes it relatively easy in the conjuncture, I think it's going to be very hard for central banks to bring about a, 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 a soft landing. Do you think uh, you know we have put enough macro potential safeguards in place that, that the financial sector can absorb an interest rate increase of that size, what's needed in order to bring inflation down? Or do you think it's unavoidable almost to have some havoc in the financial markets? Or how would you, or should we now I think, put some I think safeguards own, now? I think my own feeling is that the bigger risk here is, is less, um, what you might think of as a macro prudential response or concern about higher interest rates and much more that we're going to move into a world in which it will be clear to everyone that zombie companies won't be able to continue being zombie companies for that much longer and they will have to recognize the fact that they won't be able to repay all their debts and lenders will have to recognize losses on the balance sheet and this isn't just a question of corporate debt it's also the sovereign debt. There are serious concerns about sovereign debt around the world. Uh, and I think this means we're going to move into a period in which 
debt restructurings will become much more common. And not just in one economy, we hear a lot about China and Evergrande and debt problems in the Chinese economy, all the major economies are gonna be experiencing uh, a transition in which uh, those companies in sectors where demand has basically been stuck and supported by unsustainably low interest rates, those companies will have to restructure their debts, contract the size of the companies. And the good news is that they will be releasing resources that can be transferred to sectors and companies that can actually expand um, over the next five to 10 years. But that is not going to be something that it's easy to manage as a slow and seamless transition. I think we will see episodes in which events occur that people will find disturbing. Um, but I think it's an inevitable consequence of trying to get back to a world where real interest rates are back at more normal levels. And they're not. I mean, I, I look today that real interest rates in the US on government bonds are markedly negative at every maturity. It's not just the short term, it's long term too. And it's hard to see how that can be sustained in a growing market economy. So when you talk about debt restructuring, you talked a lot about the corporate sector domestically. Uh, do you think the household sector is better shielded compared to the last financial crisis where the household sector was very negatively affected? And then we also have sovereign debt restructuring in emerging economies and developing economies. If you look at well, I think the, the, the prospects for household debt will depend on which country you look at. It varies a great deal from one country to another. Whereas I think for corporate debt, the same problems are there. In, in all major economies. And for sovereign debt, um, I don't think this is a big issue for the G7 economies, but I do think it's an issue for emerging market economies and also for the large number of low income countries where the IMF have identified anywhere between 80 and 100 economies as needing help in order to avoid a resort to significant debt restructuring. And I think the concern is that although we've had some experience of dealing with debt restructuring of one or even a small number of low income economies and emerging economies, we haven't really seen that problem when we've had a large number of economies all at the same time experiencing the same issue. So I think that the issue of debt restructuring will be a major structural problem facing monetary and fiscal authorities in the next few years. Do you have a take on this new common framework the IMF is pushing in a sense? Some people argue it's, so, it's not really specific yet, so the specifics still have to be worked out. And the biggest challenge is essentially to bring China into the boat to have essentially a debt restructuring, which includes all creditors, including China. Well, this is always the issue with any debt restructuring, which is creditors don't want to participate unless all creditors are involved. They don't want to give up a claim on a debtor country if the money is simply going to another creditor rather than to themselves. And I think that for low income countries, we had an effective mechanism in the Paris Club, but that really does not take into account commercial bank lending. And the problem is that China finds it convenient to argue that loans made by their state banks, which are really in essence, Chinese state loans to those countries uh, should be treated as commercial bank loans rather than loans relevant to the Paris Club. I think it's going to be difficult to, to bring everyone together on this. I, but I mean, there, there is, a, I think, a reasonable amount of goodwill to find a way through it. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that it will be straightforward to, to achieve that by any means, given the number of countries that potentially could be involved. So, but you wouldn't say high inflation helps in solving this problem because you inflate some of the debt away. It depends on the duration of the debt. I mean, the trouble is that much of this debt is, is, is short term. Uh, and of course, uh, if the duration is short, you know, the markets will be rolling over the debt too quickly. You don't get very much relief from higher inflation before the interest rate you're paying on the debt as you roll it over goes up. Uh, and you're, what you already see is, which I think will, will surface quite significantly in international meetings, it, are the IMF and others saying, 
to the United States, look, be very careful when you raise interest rates because you'll do damage to low income countries that are borrowed in dollars. Well, that wasn't the fault of the United States. I mean, the, the best thing the US can do now really is to get control of inflation in the US. So coming back to the inflation expectations, do you think the market has it right? I mean, the market is still has a bit of benign view of future expectations. Um, or do you think, you know, the market is getting it wrong? And I, I guess your Maradona approach means also you make certain moves in the central banks where the market doesn't anticipate your moves uh, the right way. Well, the whole point of the Maradona approach to monetary policy, which is the idea based on the great footballer Diego Maradona, sadly now passed away, who beat five English players by running in a straight line. And if, you know, how can you beat five players by running in a straight line? Because they expected him to go to one side or the other. And that's the idea that if you were a really credible central bank, you may not need to move interest rates very far in one direction or another if the markets anticipate it. The trouble is that depends on having a really credible central bank. And I think one of the problems that central banks have fallen into the trap of in, in the last few years is to believe that somehow that credibility is independent of the actions that they take. So you find in, in some forecasting models that the credibility is, is assumed to be that everyone believes that inflation in the medium term will come back to the target irrespective of the policy that you pursue. That cannot be a sensible approach to thinking about credibility. If you start printing lots of money or have excessively low rates for a long time, people will question whether in fact inflation will come back to the target in the medium term. And so I do think that there is a real problem now. I mean, to, to me, the most astonishing fact about this is to contrast the last decade when in the United States, the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, the PCE measure of inflation, was always between one and 2% a year for a decade. It never got to zero. There was never any hint of, of having any deflation there. And from the perspective of the 1990s, when central banks around the world were becoming more independent, were thinking about inflation targets, one to 2% a year, was heaven, it was nirvana. You couldn't have a better outcome than that. And yet we got obsessed by the fact that, oh gosh, you know, inflation's only 1.4%. We can't get it up to 2%. Uh, and so, you know, the Fed, I think, fell into the trap of thinking, well, what we'll do is just announce flexible average inflation targeting. We'll say that we'll have a little bit of an overshoot for a period to compensate for these undershoots which were pretty small in any event, but no one when that framework was introduced ever said, you know, it'd be a good idea to have inflation at 7% for a while in order to compensate for the undershoots. And um, this, this belief that somehow you can't get inflation up to 2% was all very difficult. Well, once you stop trying, it's amazing what you can do. We've managed to get to seven really pretty quickly. And these things happen and I think the important thing is just to focus on you know, the narrative that the central bank can give to people in the economy. What is going on? Why is inflation high? What action are we now going to take to bring it back down? And how long is that likely to take? And I think the trouble about the present situation is that central banks have clearly been taken by surprise by what's happened. And they have for a long time kept promising people that interest rates will stay low for a very long time, believing that those statements would actually generate faster growth and push inflation up from 1.4 to 2%. This was fine tuning of, of a kind that I think beggars belief in the light of what we've seen in the last 12 months. So I think that central banks have got a very tough job on their hands now to restore credibility and to present a narrative about what's going on that people believe in, as opposed to the view, these people don't know what they're doing, they've lost control. That's where things become damaging and where inflation expectations can, can pick up. So if you look at the inflation anchors or, 
do you think it might be easily broken? What, what's the strength of the inflation anchor? How would you measure it? Do you look at household expectations of inflations or the market, the bond traders expectation? What is your best indicator how strong the anchor is? And do you think that people who never experienced inflation, they have a different take of inflation expectations because they didn't live through the 70s, let's say. And are, do they have a stronger anchor and they believe more it will come back or do they have a weaker anchor because they never experienced it? And so I think the anchor is linked to the sort of narrative that people have about what's going on. And I think the best definition of price stability is Alan Blinder's definition, which is price stability is when people stop talking about inflation mm. and that it doesn't enter their calculations, the way they think about their economic lives. And we achieved that, we, we got to that point. Well, people sure are talking about inflation now. So I think there, it, it's, it's the case that the anchor is certainly dragging quite badly. And um, I, I think possible to put a convincing quantitative story to that, uh, because in, if you use market expectations, um, then the market prices can change very quickly. So what you're really concerned with, I think, is a longer term narrative. Now, what I find from my experience was that one of the enormously beneficial aspects of what we were doing in the 1990s and early 2000s was to try and put in place a monetary policy against the background where most people could remember high and volatile inflation of the 1970s and in the use of it, and in the 1980s. And that the memory of that was, was seared in their minds and they were very supportive of policies that would bring about a return to low and stable inflation. Initially, real skepticism that it could ever be done. I mean, there were beliefs back then in the, uh, in the 1980s, there were real beliefs amongst many people that inflation would always be high. We, we simply couldn't bring it down. And that was, I think, just as foolish as the view in the last decade that inflation is going to be low forever. And that our problem is too low inflation rather than too high inflation. The, the younger generation, I mean, now we're in a situation where most central bankers don't remember the 1970s. And so there is, I think, a feeling that since inflation hasn't been the main talking point for quite a long time, that uh, the narrative was one in which we just take price stability for granted. And in many ways, that's a good thing. That's what you want. But I think the younger generation looking at the situation today will be asking, you know, what's going on? What is happening? We don't understand this. We were told that low inflation was here forever. And the real problem was that inflation was too low. Now we suddenly find ourselves 7% inflation. What is happening? And I think the challenge for the central bank, therefore, is not to worry so much about a market measure or even a survey measure, but actually to try to tell a narrative themselves that makes people believe, yes, inflation is very high now, but that does not mean we can't bring it back over a period to where it was before. And I think it's certainly within the power of the Fed to bring inflation back to 2%. Um, but they've got to recognize that the current level of interest rates is way too low for what's happening now to try to understand why we got in that position and to tell a story about what will happen to the economy as we transition back to price stability. I could make the case in a sense or try to give a story which is uh, transitive. I mean, it's like transitory, that everything is just transitory. That was the narrative that I tried to push, but I think that story lost credibility by now. And uh, now they have to well, guess, the, 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 a new story. The, the trouble is that almost any coherent theory of inflation <clears throat> will suggest that high inflation is transitory in the sense that once you put in place the appropriate policies, you will be able to bring it back down. And that, in that sense, it, what we're seeing now is transitory. However, that wasn't the sense in which the word transitory was being used. It was being used to say, oh, there are some few supply side shocks have come along that will die away very quickly. And underneath all this is a return to price stability. And I think the concern now is much wider and broader than that. 
uh, policy can still bring it back. And even if you look at the monetary aggregates, where I think the broad monetary aggregates are relevant, but not the, mm. not the monetary base, you've already seen a significant fallback in the growth rate of broad money. So this is something which means that we're facing a, a burst of inflation now, but it is likely to come back. But what's crucial, I think, is that the Federal Reserve have got to relate the path of inflation to the policy actions that it's taking. And that means, unfortunately, I think admitting that policy was just too loose in the last couple of years. Uh, and that's not easy for a central bank to do. But without that recognition, it's going to be difficult, I think, to describe a narrative in which policy could bring inflation back. So there's one striking fact is that, you know, for Japan, would you say Japan is different because inflation did not spike in Japan so far? And uh, would you say in Japan you need a different narrative? Or what is so surprising that outside of Japan or outside of Asia, you know, there's this huge inflation spike everywhere. But uh, in Japan, you don't see that's the same, kind of tried very hard, it's similar measures. Or would you, what's your explanation for this difference? So I think there are two things. One is that uh, people, when looking at the monetary stance in Japan, tend to look at the monetary base, not at the broader measures of money held by the public. And, and secondly, that they've had such a, they've had a much longer period in which inflation has been low and growth has been not too bad at all. In terms of growth per head, Japan has had a performance right up there with the rest of the G7 economies. So I think there is a difference there. They've been in this position much longer. Um, I don't think their, some of their policy statements have made a great deal of sense. And indeed, <clears throat> it seems to me that when they announced that they would go into for, for yield curve control, they wanted to peg the 10-year bond yield. What was so remarkable about that was that, you know, anyone who looked at monetary history we realized this was the complete reverse of what happened in the United States in the early 1950s, when the accord between the Fed and the US Treasury permitted the Federal Reserve not to peg 10-year yields any longer, precisely to give the Fed the power to control inflation. So basically, the independence of the Bank of Japan was handed to the finance ministry. Um, and there has been a very cautious approach to policy stimulus in Japan as a whole. If you look at almost all their you know, fiscal stimuli that they tried to put in place, they were always accompanied by strong statements saying, we'll do it this year, but next year we'll unwind it. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I don't pretend to have a coherent story for the whole Japanese experience, um, except to comment that the the governor at the time for much of this period, including the, the crisis in, in Japan, um, was always pointing out that, A, we shouldn't assume that there is something unique about Japan that couldn't happen in other countries, and B, that structural factors were very important in determining what was happening to underlying economic growth. So let me come back to the narrative, which I think is very, very important. I mean, Bob Schiller wrote a whole book on narrative economics, but in a sense, a model is always a narrative. You know, it's, it's a particular complicated narrative. And uh, you wrote a book after you know, completing your terms at the Bank of England as governor, and before that as a chief economist, you came up with the world of radical uncertainty. And uh, I was wondering whether we can go a little bit in, in that direction where do you see the role of models, the limits, and uh, the importance? And you know, in order to spell out one form of the narrative, is also to spell out the reaction function of the central bank. You know, we don't sometimes have the impression in certain parts of the world that there's no clear reaction function in a sense that if inflation stays high, how will they react? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, on that dimension? Yes, the world is very complex. That's why we build models to simplify it so that we can get our head around a problem that can be very complex and we have to simplify as much as we can to understand the essence of the problem. And then we draw 
lessons or intuitions or <clears throat> examples in our mind, which we then carry to the real world when we set policy. Um, and I think that the, the big problem with the application of models to monetary policy is that too many people set policy in the model and not in the world. And the whole point of a model is not to describe the economy. You can't do that. There's no model that describes the whole economy. The point of a model is to simplify a certain aspect of the world so you can get your head around it and learn something about it. Uh, it, it provides you know, enormous illumination about things that you can use to think about the actual and in many ways, the most useful models are the ones which are most unrealistic because they may tell you something which you know, really changes the way you think. So, you know, George Akerlof's Lemons model mm. was incredibly helpful in understanding why the first year textbook example that prices set by the intersection of demand and supply is not the whole story when there are differences in information between the two sides of the market. An idea that, like all good ideas, seems rather natural and simple when it's explained. And it was done in the context of the secondhand car market. But that model told you nothing about the secondhand car market, really. It wasn't meant to describe the secondhand car market. It was a parable. But the parable was incredibly powerful because it gave you intuition that you could then carry to the world, keep in your mind when you were actually confronting real world problems and making decisions. And I think that one of the weaknesses in monetary policy in recent years has been the belief that the incredibly simple models that are used to think about whether it's a dy dynamic setting of monetary policy uh, with agents anticipating the future, these are very useful models to give us intuition and understanding about how to think about policy. But it's an awful mistake to set policy in the model and believe that that's a description of the world. Other things are going on. And I think the, you know, I, I mean, a simple example is that I remember at the Bank of England when the Monetary Policy Committee started uh, in the mid 70s the staff would produce forecasts of inflation. And what was so striking was that it didn't seem to matter what policy we set, inflation always came back to 2%. So we said, well, why does inflation come back to 2%? And the answer was, you had to have something to close the model. And people didn't want to use, you know, for understandable reasons, relationships based on monetary aggregates or some other observable variable. So it was closed by a reaction function which essentially assumed that inflation would come back to 2%. And it was assumed that everyone believed that it would come back to 2%. And there was no easy way in that model and in the, in the forecasts that were produced to ask the question, is the policy that we are pursuing running a risk with our credibility such that the assumptions underlying the forecasts are clearly false? And you need a narrative. You've got a bit of... The models are useful as inputs into a discussion, but the policy has to reflect the discussion and not just the output of a single model. So I take it that if I make this salt water versus fresh water divide, you're more on the salt water, simple illustrative models with insights. Yes. Um, but if you look back at the, your experience in policy making, you know, both of these models, the big quantitative models, come to the table and the simple models come to the table. Isn't it nice to have both on the table, but you would say the latter have more influence in people's thinking at the, the simple models. When decision makers around the table make decisions, they in shape their decision making more. Or should well, at the Bank of England, we, we always talked about and used a family of models. Mm -hmm. We didn't want just to use a model. And the models we used to produce alternative views as to what might happen. And then you ask the question, oh, so why is it that one set of models is 
producing one forecast and another set of models gives a very different outcome. What's the, what's the economic difference between them that's generating it? That, that's the use of models to get you to stimulate discussion. But in the end, you have to come back to a judgment because no one model is meant to be a description of the world. Models are devices to ensure that you can't get away with sloppy or arguments or a lack of rigor. It's imposing rigor on the arguments. It isn't a method of describing the world. And that is the big difference from, you know, say physics or a natural science, where there are fixed laws of nature, where you can discover the law of nature. Now, and after a couple of hundred years, you believe this is a genuine law of nature and it's unchanging. We're not in that world. That's what radical uncertainty is, is really all about. Things are changing all the time. So let's perhaps move uh, to the time when you started at the Bank of England as chief economist before you took on your uh, long tenure as governor of the Bank of England. Um, you know, inflation targeting uh, in the 90s took over, but, uh, you know, first, you know, the England, UK had challenges with exchange rate. How did this play out and how did it come to inflation targeting in the beginnings? Perhaps you can look back in your own experience a little bit and tell us what the, the decisive elements were and what made people change their paradigm towards inflation targeting. And then later we might talk about the, the limits of inflation targeting. In the 1970s, I think there was a view that something had gone badly wrong because it had been assumed that you could run the economy at a very high level of activity without producing inflation. And it was a really, it was the time of the natural rate hypothesis, um, rational expectations. Basically the proposition was there's no long run trade off between inflation and employment and output. And therefore, macroeconomic policy needed to ensure that there was a monetary policy framework which would ensure price stability. 1980s, the first attempt to do this was based on monetary aggregates. The problem was that policy had changed the structure of the financial system very markedly with an abolition of a number of important controls not least exchange controls, which meant that the quantitative interpretation of monetary aggregates proved really problematic. So then there was a switch to first implicit and then explicit linking of the exchange rate to the Deutsche Mark to try to inherit the credibility aspects that the Bundesbank had built up. And the problem with that was that another unexpected event occurred, which was German unification, which meant that Germany needed a much tighter monetary policy with higher interest rates to dampen down domestic demand, given the integration of East and West Germany. And so being in the exchange rate mechanism, linking sterling to the Deutsche Mark turned out to be highly deflationary. Now that certainly helped to bring inflation down, no question about that. However, it led to such a deep recession that this was not something that anyone believed could really continue politically. And so when Germany raised interest rates again, there was a crisis in financial markets where people said, look, there's no way British governments are gonna be prepared to raise interest rates to the levels necessary to maintain the exchange rate link. And we had, September uh, 1992 was when Britain was forced out of the exchange rate mechanism by massive speculation. At that point, we had very quickly to put together a domestic monetary policy framework. And our experience had been that the intermediate targets, whether you think of them as monetary targets, either monetary base or broad monetary aggregates or exchange rate link, none of these had worked because there were structural changes going on in the economy that made them hard to implement. And so a much simpler heuristic would be to target inflation itself. That's what the public could see. And we could produce a narrative on a regular basis that would explain to the public why the actions we were taken, taking were consistent with maintaining price stability in the medium term. 
and to bring inflation back towards target if it deviated from that. And that proved incredibly successful because we still had to use data on whether it was the monetary aggregates, the exchange rate, the labor market. All of these things had to be discussed and debated, but that could be done, if you like, in an expert environment where economists in the city and elsewhere could participate in that debate. But the upshot was people could see that the Bank of England was setting monetary policy to achieve a low and stable inflation target initially, well, ultimately a target of 2%. And that proved, I think, extremely effective at demonstrating that there was a degree of you know, professional competence involved in setting interest rates that had not been there before because interest rates had previously been set by politicians. And um, this was a big regime change, there's no question about it. And you can see that um, from 92 to 97, the Bank of England developed and evolved an independent voice in monetary policy. Then in 1997, we were given formal independence to set interest rates. And that led to a big fall in measures of inflation expectations in financial markets. And we had a very successful period, you know, after that, the uh, transparency was a key element to it. Yeah, so I wanted to ask about, I mean, uh, what was very nice of this setup in, in the UK was essentially that the Treasury was determining the target and the implementation was then done. So the separation between the UK Treasury and, uh, and the Bank of England was a very innovative framework at that time. But the, the second innovation of inflation targeting is essentially with transparency, and you alluded to that. To what extent is the transparency important to have a convincing narrative? Is, does both have to go hand in hand? Can you have a convincing narrative without transparency? And what role does press conference, inflation reports, fan charts you invented at that time, uh, what role does that play? Perhaps you can elaborate on this, on, on this dimension. So I think you have to have a degree of transparency in order for the narrative to carry any weight. So you, know, you can't just say the Bank of England has looked at the situation and we believe that inflation will come back to target. That isn't a very compelling narrative. <clears throat> and I was very struck by the fact that as our new framework evolved, uh, particularly after independence with nine members on the Monetary Policy Committee, that publishing the, the minutes of those meetings with differences of view. And indeed, as governor, I was in a minority uh, on three occasions. Um, and that didn't undermine the credibility of it, it rather enhanced it because people would say, um, yeah, well, actually, I don't agree with the decision you made last month, but I'm really happy with the framework because my feelings about it and the arguments I would have liked to see win the day were actually discussed at the meeting. And I can see that because of the minutes. So I think you've got to set out an argument which basically says you know there are these reasons for thinking that perhaps inflation is going to be above target we need to raise interest rates and another set of reasons that says actually you know, it's not a good idea to raise interest rates now and to put those on the table be open about it and then to say actually a majority of the committee came down on this side rather than the other side but not pretend in the way that politicians always do that their position is obviously right and the position of the opposition is obviously wrong mm -hmm. uh, it's not it's it's a it's a nuanced position always and in doing that spelling that out you gain credibility and i think the important thing about the narrative is that it has to evolve and change over time so you know we were learning about the economy all the time one of the good things was that the bank was probably the first institution in the country to recognize the significance of large numbers of people coming from Eastern Europe into the UK, which meant that actually there was no fixed supply of labor. More demand generated its own supply. So the Phillips curve became very flat. Um, and to, to talk about these things in an open way. But I want to also say what transparency is not. I don't believe that transparency is about um, having transcripts of meetings. Because as soon as you have the as soon as you require meetings to have to publish transcripts, say five, seven, eight years later, the meeting stops being a useful meeting. 
And all that happens is, is you get a series of people going around the table, reading out a prepared statement, which is a little value and certainly is not the decision-making process. So, you know, what happens at the Fed and I think now at the Bank of England is that the real meetings, the real discussions take place before the meetings at which you are compelled to produce transcripts. So, so I guess you also very critical of the US Fed has this rule is more than three governors talk to each other. It has yes. transcribed. Yeah, I mean, it's very I, th this seems to me absurd because that's not transparency in order to generate a narrative that the rest of the world can understand and criticize. There has to be a room for private conversations. And what the transparency really means when the central bank takes a decision, it should be forced to explain that decision and give the reasons for it. It doesn't mean that every meeting of the central bank should be either live on television or in the form of a written transcript five, six years later. That isn't transparency that serves any purpose. In fact, I think it's counterproductive. Now, it, you talked about the fan charts that we produced. The, mm -hmm. the one thing that I was absolutely determined to do at the very beginning when I joined the bank was to get away from the idea of point forecasts. Um, I find it hard to believe that anyone can issue a point forecast and regard that as a coherent statement. It isn't. There is a lot of uncertainty about it. And it, the most important aspect of a decision is very often, are the risks more on one side of a central view than the other side? And is there a great deal of uncertainty or not much uncertainty? These are the big questions. So right from the first inflation report, which was the document that underpinned our voice and independence in February 1993. Even in that very first report, we had um, bands, which illustrated the average oh. forecast error from past experience to illustrate the uncertainty about the forecast. And then we evolved that into a, a rather nice uh, official fan chart with bands representing different probability intervals, uh, which we published. And I think this was also, you know, th this was help. In fact, to begin with, those charts were shown live on television on the day of our press conferences. Yes. And then the producers of television programs who struggled to cope with anything quantitative. I still vividly I remember that because I was at the LSE at, at that time when, when the fan charts uh, were presented. But coming back to your narrative and perhaps also fan charts, you probably have to have one communication strategy to more sophisticated audiences who read in minutes and all this, and then to the others who you know don't want to be bothered by inflation, they just want to make sure that the inflation is not too high. So do you have different narratives or different subgroups or do you have, they have to be consistent with each other as well? How do you can handle this communication strategy that uh, you talk to different audiences uh, and make sure that there's a common narrative behind, but then there's fine tuning across the different audiences. Well, I personally found that I would give the same explanations to any kind of audience, because if you can put across what may be a complex position in rather not simple minded terms, but straightforward, clear and simple terms, then people can understand it, whether they are um, you know, if they bother to come to an event, they obviously have some interest in what is the inflation outlook, what's going to happen in the economy. But I found that some of the more sophisticated audience, audiences allegedly were some of the least sensible because they'd want to get out their slide rule and try and measure the precise value of the central forecast in a fan chart. And I said, this is completely pointless. It's the impression on your eye about how much uncertainty there is and where the risks are that matters. And then we can talk about it and discuss it. But this wish to always um, come up with a precise numerical forecast for some future event is something that I have found that people in government in many countries feel under great pressure to satisfy. And it's a disaster to give into it because you'll always be proved wrong. Uh, and you're not actually doing anything that's very useful. Uh, what you need to do is to get people to think about, you know, what is perhaps a likely path of events, but more importantly, what are the risks around that? Where are the risks coming from? 
Are there things we can do to mitigate those risks? The, the, those, I think, are the key things in, in making a decision, not pretending that we know. So I've always thought there is something very odd about the dot plots in the Fed's charts. Uh -huh. I mean, the fact is the Federal Reserve doesn't have any idea where interest rates are likely to be a year from now, no. and certainly not three or four years from now. And it doesn't make any sense to pretend that we do. Nobody well, instead, made... of, instead of dots, you want to give, they should give intervals? Well, intervals. There, there is a challenge if you're trying to put across the ideas of you know, a group of separate individuals. Uh, and I think we're much better for, for not to focus too much uh, on the numbers that individuals think, but to see if there is a collective agreement on a narrative about likely paths and risks to it above and below. Uh, I mean, I think the, the biggest challenge that we didn't solve at the bank was how to cope with presenting some sort of forecast when you've got nine people on a committee. You do not want to present nine different forecasts. Mm -hmm. They're just confusing. And it tells you more about differences of view than anything else. You want to know, you know, what is the debate on the committee? What are the issues that people are disagree on? Uh, not that they have a dot plot that looks different, but why are they different? What are, what are the reasons for it being different? So you raised already some challenges of inflation targeting. Perhaps we can go to the next uh, block where saying of stretching inflation targeting. Where do you see the limits of inflation targeting or the shortcomings and where are we moving to? You know, we have you know, forward guidance. So we have the natural rate of interest. Nobody really know what our star is or the natural rate yeah. of unemployment, how to measure it. And we have many rates, not just the short-term rate. We have perhaps even a natural price of risk or risk premium. Yeah. Why only the risk-free rate? Why only the, so it's not obvious. And where do you see the future of the flexible average inflation targeting framework? Uh, you mentioned in the initial phase, now we have 7% inflation in the United States. So will we correct for that subsequently? Or you know, how do you see uh, this uh, coming and playing out? And I think you, you're very much a money man. So for you, money was always important. And you know, a lot of inflation targeting moved to a framework where money was not the key in the monetary economics and monetary overhang aspects and all this. Perhaps you can allude to that. Do we have to bring money back? We don't have own, we have this cashless economy models. Do we have to take money more seriously in our models going forward? So there are two different questions, I think. One is what sort of models should we be looking at? And secondly, how should policy be set in the world? And uh, you know, I don't think we should go back to the idea that there is one measure of money that can be used in order to determine policy. But I do think that if you observe, not so much the monetary base, because we saw <clears throat> in the financial crisis that the whole point about having a rapid expansion of the monetary base was to prevent broad money from falling yeah. sharply. So it is broad money that really matters, money in the hands of the public. If that is moving at either plus 20% a year or minus 20% a year, you have to ask the question, what is this telling us? What is going on? Now, it doesn't mean to say there's a simple automatic answer to that, irrespective of circumstances, but you need to, to ask the question, what is going on? And I think that's the, the, the point about this. There is a kind of, the danger of setting policy in the model is that you believe that you can fine tune what is going to happen. And that I think is the trap into which flexible average inflation targeting has fallen. The idea that we can control inflation sufficiently precisely that we can you know, aim to have inflation at say 3% a year for 18 months and then bring it back to 2% in order to offset previous undershoots of inflation below 2%. Well, here we are, you know, a year, a year and a bit, a year and a half perhaps into the new framework and inflation's at seven. Well, that was, wasn't the conscious result of the application of the, of the framework. And in a sense, the framework's just been overwhelmed by events. And it's not sensible to have a framework that can be that easily overwhelmed by events. But I do think a framework in which people ask the question, you know, what's going on? 
you, people talk a lot about the natural rate of interest, but there's a real parallel with the lessons from the study of the natural rate of unemployment. That was a concept which was incredibly powerful in helping us to understand that there may well be no long run trade off between inflation and unemployment. Let me put it in that very simple way. That was a very powerful intuition that you could take away. So people inevitably decided to go out and estimate the natural rate of unemployment. Now the trouble with it is that the, the idea, the intuition that there isn't a long run trade off came from a model in which you could define a natural rate of unemployment. But you know, Freeman's definition, the natural rate of unemployment was at the rate of unemployment that will be ground out by the Valrhasian equations. But we don't live in a Valrhasian world. We don't live in a world of complete markets. And so what happened was when people try to estimate the natural rate of unemployment, what do they find? Amazingly, it actually seemed to follow the actual rate of unemployment with a lag. And it was very hard to believe that there was some independent measure of the natural rate of unemployment that was useful in setting policy. Well, I think the same is true of the natural rate of interest. You know, 20 years from now, people will look back and say, well, guess what? Natural rate of interest fell very sharply in the 2010s, stayed a bit low perhaps in the 2020s and then rose again. But that's not an independent measure or something that's going on in the world. And I think this is this is where there are limits to models. You have to ask the question you know, the, that we've learned some very big lessons from the models with natural rate of unemployment. But does it really make sense to think that there is a, a stationary number that represents it that we can actually use to set policy? And I don't think the answer is that it's helpful. And it's I think that is certainly true of the natural rate of interest. So I, um, you know, I, I'm skeptical that we should assume that we can write down a model in which these things are well defined, and then basically set policy in the model, and then use those numbers and take it to the world. It is it is much more complex than that, and I think the last couple of years have demonstrated that. So all these rates are at the short end of the yield curve. Once we move. To manipulate the longer end of the yield curve, that we move into balance sheet of the central bank aspects, you know, QE, and uh, we talked about the yield curve control already. Um, can you look a little bit? How do you see the future of central bank balance sheet looking like? So we have increased the size of the balance sheets quite a lot. Will they stay larger in all the futures, or we're living now with a much larger central bank balance sheet? even though we might have high inflation or will the balance sheet shrink again, not to the same level we had before, but will it come back down? How do you see the optimal size of the central bank balance sheet playing out uh, in the future? And will it move up and down depending uh, if we do more QE or less uh, quantitative tightening, quantitative easing and so forth? So I'm sure it will vary over time. I mean, of course, the interesting thing is that there is no optimal balance sheet in terms of setting monetary policy. Your ability to set monetary policy is not a function of the size of the balance sheet. You can do it at any balance sheet size you like. What QE was designed to do initially, the way I talked about it, though not the way I think the Fed talked about it, was to say after uh, September, October 2008, what we saw was that commercial banks were desperate to contract the size of their balance sheet, both through regulatory pressure, but also market pressure. And therefore they were pulling in loans. They didn't want to extend lending. And you know the one iron law of economics is double entry bookkeeping. So that meant the size of their, asset, of their liabilities had to contract as well. And um, that meant the bank deposits were actually falling. And I think there was a genuine concern that if the absolute value of broad money in the economy was going to contract significantly, that would threaten something like a repeat of the Great Depression. So you needed to take some offsetting action. Well, interest rates have been really reduced to close to zero. So the idea that you could cut rates further and encourage people to borrow and banks would be willing to meet that demand for borrowing not really a feasible option. 
So QE was actually in many ways a rather traditional policy instrument, which was to say the central banks would buy government bonds and that would boost the level of bank deposits of the institutions that sold bonds to the central bank by the same absolute amount as the QE purchases. So it helped to offset the contraction of deposits by commercial banks. But since their commercial bank deposits are so much larger than the size of uh, the central bank purchases uh, and the monetary base, then you had to have a big expansion of the monetary base through QE in order to have a noticeable impact on broad money. And so a lot of QE was done, but it didn't lead to a significant growth rate of broad money. It prevented a decline of a marked size, but it didn't prevent, it didn't lead to a significant expansion. So 2020, 2020, 2021, that was not true. Commercial banks were not contracting their balance sheets. So the QE that was done <clears throat> added to the expansion of broad money. And you think that's the explanation why the inflation spiked so much because it was just adding to the money, unlike after in the great financial crisis, it was just substituting, replacing the shrinking of the private money with public money. Yes, and I think that there are a whole series of things that could follow from that. <clears throat> One is the portfolio effect of an expansion of broad money, where the actions are taken to push up asset prices of other kinds of assets. But also it made it very much easier for governments to run big deficits because they didn't have to sell as much debt to the private sector. And so you know, whether you want to attribute it to the expansion of government spending or to the expansion of broad money, I think it, you can choose whichever explanation you like. These things happened simultaneously and they were linked. Um, but I think what was done, uh, I think was undoubtedly something that was that led to the inflationary spike. And I think the, there are interesting contrasts between the US and, and Europe in this respect. So I think in the US, because there was no furlough scheme, unemployment was allowed to rise to very high levels for a short period and then brought back down again. It was easier for people to use a narrative that confused what was going on under COVID-19 with a conventional business cycle, but just of a much deeper <clears throat> magnitude. And I think that in Europe, that wasn't true. The, the fiscal measures taken by governments in Europe, I don't like to use the phrase, phrase to describe them as fiscal stimulus, because the aim was not to boost aggregate demand. The aim of the furlough scheme and the significant expansion of government budget deficits was to enable companies to survive yeah. while maintaining employment. The people weren't producing anything, but they were still being paid by companies, financed by transfers from government under the furlough scheme. And what that did was that governments were trying to prevent a further large contraction of supply in the medium term. There was a big contraction of supply in the short term because governments closed parts of the economy and households decided that they had no wish to go out to spend money on hospitality or cinemas or theatres. So a mixture of household decisions and government decisions contracted the size of the supply of the economy. But the government was trying to prevent that leading to a persistent contraction of supply in the medium term by allowing businesses to survive. And that was the, the nature of the increase in budget deficits. I don't think of that as fiscal stimulus, but of transfer, intergenerational transfers to prevent the collapse of businesses. And I think it was a very sensible thing to do. What was much less obvious was why central banks wanted to print a lot more money. Yeah. And I think it reflects something that I am worried about, which is that it, once you stop telling a narrative about what's happening in the economy in terms of economic variables, but rely on the assumption of central bank credibility to underpin the medium term path of inflation. You end up with a position in which you know, central banks think that 
QE is just something you always do when there's bad news. And whether it's Britain voting to leave the European Union, let's do some QE. Whether it's, gosh, there's a pandemic, let's do some QE. But the important question to ask is, what is the economic justification for a monetary policy response? And I think that argument, there may be many answers to that, but that question very often was not posed. And central banks seem to take the position that it's important that we demonstrate that we're here. And um, you know, don't worry, we're on the case. But being on the case has to be justified by a story about why the monetary response is necessary. And I think that with COVID-19, the problem was that the very sharp falls in demand and GDP in Britain of up to 20% were actually matched by a corresponding reduction in supply. And so that the argument was not, this was not a business cycle. Normally in a business cycle downturn, you think that demand has contracted, maybe a loss of confidence, but basically supply in the economy hasn't changed very much. And so you want to stimulate demand by monetary and fiscal yeah. policy to bring demand back up to the unchanged path of supply. Here, both demand and supply fell broadly together. And I think the risk of that is if you think, oh gosh, GDP's fallen, we better do something, that you end up printing far more money than you should be doing, and you then get inflation as a consequence. What do you think about going back to the balance sheet? You know, you can actually buy government bonds, which is considered in many countries as a risk-free asset, or you can also buy more risky bonds or more risky assets like uh, corporate bonds and other things in order to get the, the risk premium down. So you try to manipulate not only uh, the, the term spread, but also credit risk premium and other aspects to it. And if you go to the European Union or the Euro area, you know, there are certain bonds which are more risky and less risky. And, uh, you know, you essentially control also some risk premium on top of it. Is this the role the central bank should also take in order? Let's suppose you go through a pandemic and there might be multiple equilibria and you try to avoid a bad equilibrium and then you will really step in. And when do you know whether it's a, a bad equilibrium you want to avoid or when do you know it's just undermining other and leading to inflation down the road? I think there are two steps in this argument. The first one is the general economic proposition. Is there a case for intervening to reduce risk premium or to try and choose one equilibrium rather than another? That's an economic argument. The second argument is once you've answered that first question, which body should be charged with the responsibility of doing it? Mm. And my feeling is that if you decide that you want to uh, by uh, the state should be buying risky assets to try and reduce the risk premium or trying to shift from one equilibrium to another, then it's not the job of the central bank to make decisions about which risky assets to buy. And, you know, in the case of the European Union, which country's bonds to buy. That the central bank should be buying uh, the safe assets issued by government because their mandate is to meet price stability. And as soon as you allow an independent central bank to get involved in uh, credit decisions, then the justification for political independence goes away, I think. And I think I'll give you two examples. One, a serious one, which is the, the Euro area, where the whole point of the European Treaty governing monetary union was, and it was written in the European Treaty, that it was not the role of the ECB to bail out governments that were struggling with sovereign debt. And that if that, that was to be done, it should be done by the finance ministers of the Euro area, reaching an agreement on a fiscal union. And what's the problem for the, the European Central Bank is that they've been forced to adopt quasi-fiscal measures in order to hold the monetary union together in a way that has the potential to undermine their reputation as a central bank because they will be accused or could be down the road of trying to create a fiscal union through the back door. 
by pretending that there isn't one. These are just central bank actions. And the European Court of Justice has been willing to go along with that because when this was challenged in the courts, the response of the European Court of Justice was to say, but if the ECB decides it wants to do it, then by definition, it must be monetary policy. Well, that's a, one of the craziest arguments I've heard for a long while. Well, I'll give you another example, a, a silly example in a way, but it's a true one. Uh, when I went to Parliament, uh, people would say to me, well, look, you say you want to buy government bonds, but not uh, private sector assets. And I said, yes, if we have no mandate from Parliament to make decisions about which businesses we should be buying the instruments issued by those businesses. And they said, but this is terrible. I mean, surely you could do far more to stimulate the economy by doing that. And I said, well, true. I could think of a you know, relatively small company in the Midlands. And if they were to issue bonds or equity and we bought them, I can guarantee it would boost consumer confidence enormously in that region and boost demand. And they said, well, why would not you do it? And I said, well, because the company I have in mind buying the issue the shares of is Aston Villa Football Club. And if we were to do that, consumer confidence would rise enormously. And you, you can't do that. You can't do that, they said. I said, well, now you see my point. You know, we don't have the authority to make that kind of judgment and decision. If you think the government should get involved in deciding that the state should find the liabilities issued by one company, but not another company, then that is a political decision. Don't give it to an independent central bank. So, this... so because the central bank could easily buy government bonds mm. and then the government could decide itself <clears throat> which of the assets, uh, which, which instruments from the private sector it wishes to buy. It doesn't stop it occurring, but it's very important. It's something which I think is often overlooked in economics, which is that for institutions to be successful, you need to be very clear about what the responsibilities are for that institution. And of course, in all our economic analysis, we tend to think of what will maximize social welfare. And we don't really think a lot about which institution should be asked to do which measures to achieve that. So your answer shows a, a, also that you're big in sports. I mean, you also, I think you are, I guess, also involved in Wilmington, managing Wilmington and many, many things in the UK and in the sports area and of course football is, is big uh, for you and for many people in England and across the globe. Let me just go uh, to another topic where we touched upon that already. Uh, central bank mandate and independence so we have to speed up a little bit we're running a little bit late but you know there's all this debate you know central banks should care about climate change there might be promoting specific sectors we talked about that uh, what's about the next financial crisis? So where do you think is the limits central banks should go and should not go? And uh, you know, what's your take? Can you give some guidance? How do you think? And I think you alluded already in the previous answer. Uh, where yeah, so I, it's, and I mean, central, bank should, central banks should be involved in things which their instruments can make some impact on. And I think, you know, one of the things I worry about is that in, in the last decade, Perhaps because interest rates were low and were hardly changed at all. So central banks said, well, what are we doing? You know, they go home at night and say to their children, ask them, Daddy, what did you do today at the central bank? Well, you know, we, we met with our friends again and decided to do nothing. And this happens year after year. And so you want to do something. And so central banks felt they had to justify their existence by being involved in doing something. Climate change is a good example. No one would ever create a central bank in order to deal with climate change. And the instruments of central bank are singularly ill-equipped to be the main methods of responding to, to climate change, whether it be in terms of monetary policy, that is, whether which bonds, corporate bonds, do you buy uh, under QE, where you know the Bank of England has issued a very good paper on this, but you, it reveals the, the difficulty. It, it ties itself in knots in trying to work out which companies' bonds you might buy. I mean, you don't want to buy bonds of a company that's issue, having large emissions and saying we won't buy bonds of those companies because then you have no influence on the companies at all at that point. So they end up by concluding that, well, we ought to 
encourage the purchases of bonds issued by companies that we think in a subjective assessment are making the best efforts to try to reduce their emissions. Well, a subjective assessment like that is no basis on which to convince people that you're using your powers appropriately. And although it, in terms of risks to the financial system, it's very hard to deny that if there are risks from uh, climate change to the financial sector, then central banks need to think about these risks. The trouble is that all the, all the effort is going into only one kind of risk, that is a risk from climate change. So people talk about stranded assets, oil and gas underground. Well, if you want to see a stranded asset, the last two years will have given you much better examples. Fleets of aeroplanes parked on deserts around the world. Cruise ships floating in the ocean with no passengers. These are stranded assets, literally stranded. Uh, and there are risks not just from climate change, but from pandemics, from cybersecurity, geopolitics. Are we supposed to worry about banks and the financial sector lending too much to companies that have close relationships with Taiwan that could be severely reduced in value as a result of events by China in Taiwan? Russia in Ukraine. I mean, there are so many risks, and I'm not sure that it makes sense to think that central banks are at the vanguard here of the appropriate policy measures to deal with climate change. And it's not very convincing when governments that refuse to introduce a carbon tax turn around and say, well, central banks must do their bit. Um, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. So let's, uh, we're running way over time, but let me just raise one more issue and perhaps touch it uh, briefly, which is about CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. And I just saw that uh, two days ago, the House of Lords came out with a report. And I guess you were probably involved in writing the report or at least uh, providing feedback. And it came out pretty negative. I mean, it, it said a solution in search of a problem uh, it might lead to more state surveillance, uh, it might create financial instability, it might give too much power, unspecified powers to central banks. Um, but there might also be some good things like, you know, reducing credit card fees and uh, payment fees across the borders and financial inclusion. W where do you come down on that? So just a few words at the end. You're very critical on CBDCs or you're open or perhaps you can give us your perspective. On so this, this was a report. Academia. This was a report from the Economic Affairs Committee of the House of Lords, and I'm a member of that committee. And the report was Central Bank Digital Currencies. The title of it was Central Bank Digital Currencies: Colon A Solution in Search of a Problem? Question mark. Okay. And what we were doing was not coming up with statements about what should or should not happen, but as a view that the Bank of England and the Treasury in the UK had to explain first what was the problem to which a central bank digital currency might be the solution. And we hadn't seen any convincing arguments to that effect so far. So the, first of all, a central bank digital currency is not a currency. If the Bank of England issues one, it will be in sterling. And if the Fed issues one, it will be in dollars. It's about payment systems. So the question is, how can we make a more efficient payment system? And it is possible to argue that a CBDC might go some way to do that, but it's far from obvious. And in fact, you mentioned credit card fees. Well, that's a lot to do with competition, entry into the process. Yeah. Um, the idea that you, if we're worried about the lack of competition in the private sector payment system, we solve it by creating a state-run monopoly is not wildly convincing at first sight. <clears throat> and in terms of all the dimensions of payment systems that we have, um, they're all digital now anyway. I, I can make digital payments to you in the US or to anyone in the UK paying my bills by going onto the internet, a couple of clicks, zero cost payment made. So in the UK context, it's far from obvious that there will in fact be any real changes in the way the payment system would operate. 
The Bank of England has made it very clear that it does not want to issue a bank account to every citizen in the UK. <clears throat> it couldn't cope with having 65 million customers. It doesn't have any customers at present on the retail level. Um, and it, so it would all be done anyway through uh, a third party, whether it be commercial banks or other payment system operators that would be operating a sort of digital wallet backed by the central bank. But central banks already back retail deposits. They do it through either deposit insurance schemes or if uh, the system, if the system itself is really in trouble, they actually stand behind the banking system. You could improve that framework, in my view, by moving to something like the pawnbroker for all seasons idea I talked about in my book, The End of Alchemy, without having a central bank digital currency as such. The idea is that the central bank is ready to stand behind the payment system. That's the important point. You don't need a CBDC to do that. And at the wholesale level, the Bank of England said to us in evidence that it felt absolutely no need to have a CBDC at the wholesale level. In essence, we already have one. They're called reserves held by commercial banks with the central bank. And QE has been a significant increase in the effective wholesale CBDC issuance by the Bank of England. So there are a lot of people around who seem to think that it's all very exciting, it's new, um, because the word digital is somehow attached to it. Um, but in practice, much of what they want to see happen has already been achieved. And where there are areas where there is a clear need for improvement, which is cross-border transactions, it's not obvious that CBDCs will in and of themselves solve that problem, because you need to have then a large number of bilateral agreements between central banks in order to get to a system in which central banks are clearing with each other and then internally their own payment system takes over. So there is certainly a lot to be done in terms of thinking about payment systems. That is certainly true. Um, and there are, there are concerns about the regulation of either genuine digital currencies like Bitcoin or the 7,000 other digital currencies. And there will be serious questions about the regulation of stable coins. These are big, big questions. But simply creating a central bank digital currency, on the face of it, it's not obvious that it brings about the sort of transformation people often assume it must lead to. Good. So let's uh, uh, leave it at that. I mean, the different perspectives, of course, there's also we're moving forward into a more digital world. And it will be the case that perhaps currency might be way more fragmented. So we'll have a lot of different currencies and, and a CBDC might be a unifying anchor. But I can see that, you know, you might be achieving things like a unified currency uh, with different ways, uh, also with, uh, you know, modernizing bank regulation, modernizing uh, many other aspects in, in, in the central banking universe. So I would like to conclude that because we, we're running really late, but I think it was fascinating to hear your perspective, all your wealth of knowledge you accumulated over your, your life. And uh, you have been at many, many spots. Uh, you know, I've been uh, chief economist, governor of the Bank of England, of course, many international meetings, be it in Basel, be it international G7 and so forth. Um, so very few people will have this insight you gave us uh, today. I think it was, I'm very grateful for giving us this perspective and uh, we will think about it and perhaps it will modify our research and will modify our thinking. And hopefully we will get to a world with more price stability and more financial stability down the road. And uh, I think it will definitely help us uh, to think on one main lesson I also took away from it that we in economics might be focusing too little on institutions and that's you know first order importance if you think about the real world as well. So thanks again and uh, we stay in touch and thanks to all the participants and next week we will have uh, Larry Summers and Paul Krugman talking about the inflation debate we had this one year ago where there was a very different perspective 
Paul was less worried about inflation. He was more worried about political cohesion in the country, while uh, Larry was very worried about inflation already and was one of the early warner warning signs came up and he was really indicating inflation is coming and we will have a second round after one year and see the different perspectives out there have evolved. And I hope everybody will come and join us next week as well. Thanks again. Thank you for uh, inviting me to appear on your webinar, Marcus. No, and thanks. Let, let's hope we can make some real progress in economics and make things better over the next decade. Thanks and let's work together. Hope to see you soon again, hopefully also in the real world. Exactly, Bye. yes. Bye.